I'd like to welcome every, each and every one of you to our hip hop lecture. The goal is for this to be an annual lecture each year at Princeton Theological Seminary. The theme for this lecture tonight, the overarching theme is art as resistance. To resist a resistance has been our theme for the entire year. And so we are very glad that you're here. We welcome you. And we are equally and even more glad for our esteemed lecturer tonight. First of all, I want to say the brother's cool. <laughs> he's cool, he's laid back, he's brilliant. But what's the most striking quality that I've gathered from my time around him is that when you have genius with humility, it is a wonderful intersection. And so just to give you a little bit of background before we just turn him loose and just let him go. He's got 23 years of urban multi-ethnic youth work experience. He's Daniel White Hodge, PhD. I mean, no, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> He's got a PhD. He's recognized as a youth culture expert and a cultural literacy scholar. Dr. Hodge is Associate Professor of Intercultural Communications and Department Chair of Communications Arts at North Park University in Chicago. Dr. Hodge's research interests are the intersections of faith, hip hop culture, race and ethnicity, young adult emerging generations. He has written four books, Heaven as a Ghetto, The Missiology, Gospel, and Theology of Tupac Shakur, The Soul of Hip Hop, Rims, Tims, and the Culture Theology, Hip Hop's Hostile Gospel, A Post-Soul Theological Exploration, and Homeland Security, A Hip Hop Missiology for the Post-Civil Rights Context. Dr. Hodge plans to, co to release a co-authored text dealing with current ethnic minority young adult context called Between God and Kendrick, Youth Work in a Post-Civil Rights Context. Dr. Hodge is also the founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of Hip Hop Studies. He is working and currently investigating the spirituality, nominality, and theological development of emerging young adults in urban and city contexts, and is working on a manuscript investigating neocolonialism and white supremacy within short-term missions to city context. He received a PhD from Fuller Graduate School of Intercultural Studies. His dissertation focused on the life theology and spiritual message of Tupac Shakur, titled Baptized in Dirty Water, the Missiological Gospel of Tupac. He graduated cum laude from Cal State Monterey Bay, where he focused on academic attainment and self-esteem among African-American adolescents. Dr. Hodge has been a national speaker and spoken at Christian Community Development Association, Urban Youth Workers Institute, and other national conferences. He has been involved in hip hop culture his entire life. As a former music producer, he mixed Bone Thugs and Harmony first album, E1999 Eternal, along with Beastie Boys' DJ Hurricane album. He also helped in the formation of different background tracks for the first two seasons of New York Undercover, and he continues to main closely in tune with hip hop music today. So you got rap producer, scholar, cool cat, genius, humble. I mean, no, that's a good mix, right? <laughs> He's gonna remix this thing in a little while though. He's gonna deal with a number of topics relevant. He's gonna deal with hip hop culture. He's gonna deal with theology. And he will also tonight, he's gonna touch our head, but ultimately I think he's gonna touch our heart as well. He is married and the proud parent of an 11-year-old dancing daughter, Mahalia Joy, who has become versed in hip-hop theological theory. So he talked about his daughter. So you got a good father and a good husband as well. So my brother, come up here, remix it, and turn it loose, Dr. Daniel White Hodge. Man alive! Uh, wow, that's uh, quite the uh, that's quite the introduction. Man. I gotta take you with me in, in places I go. Um, well, thank you very much. I am excited to uh, be here as a, an avid podcaster. I'll probably be recording myself as well. Uh, if you're on podcast, Profane Faith, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me out. Thank you for uh, bringing me out here. The organizers, I thank you so much. This has been uh, a pleasure uh, to be out here and to connect. I'm excited to talk a little bit more about hip hop, resistance, uh, theological contributions. Um, a large part of the last portion of my life has been, you know, kind of dedicated to this and looking at, 
you know, how hip hop speaks beyond the commercialization, beyond what we see uh, in the immediate image of what hip hop has become, particularly in the commercial sense. And so, you know, as I get started, I think uh, I need to say, you know, since the, and really before that, I mean, if you're an ethnic minority, you know that this country has been hostile to us from day one. Uh, the 2016 election, I think, just really revealed what those hostilities are manifested in, particularly in the highest office. I mean, it's, you know, many have already said that, you know, Trump is the first white president. Uh, then, so what does that mean then in an era of Black Lives Matter, of BYP 100? And what does that mean when organizers can put themselves together on both sides, right? On both progressive uh, and on the, the, the anti-progressive side, the alt-right, uh, through hashtags, right? And through organizing themselves and through uh, social online communities. I think we are at a time and at a place in space where we are at war. As a rhetorician, as somebody who studies rhetoric and hermeneutic, um, I see that on a daily basis. Uh, I have young people. Uh, the average now is uh, those under the age of 15 check their phone uh, at least 325 times daily. Um, I, in my media theory course, uh, I have them keeping uh, a tab of how much they ingest. One student came back last week and eight and a half hours on YouTube alone. That was just YouTube, that wasn't Snapchat. Um, and conversely, um, I've had students who say they get their news from Snapchat and Twitter and places like that. So we have, I'm not against these things, but it does bring us about in a sense of a loss of critical intellect in the sense that what is the news that we're actually getting? And people who are a little bit more on that side, hence people from Russia have been able to create a sense of rhetoric and mantra that may or may not exist, correct? And because we believe a lot of what we see in front of us and re then retweet it without any kind of critical conscience, it becomes more and more apparent that our intellect, we have to critically understand what is it that we are taking in. Chuck D said it the best, that the um, landscape and really the minefield of the 21st century is the mind. Ideology is big. Ideology. What can I tell you and what can I create in you? Ideology is rooted in us. Uh, it's, it's bigger than behavior. I mean, it, it, it constructs behavior. And so um, I do. I come to you tonight, you know, particularly heavy hearted as we're dealing with all kinds of things. It almost seems like every day it's something new. It's something worse. Uh, and uh, it's hard to not overlook that and see how those are not planned because then it's like when you do do something in a normal sane society, you think, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. But in this society, we're like, oh, well, that's not as bad. Um, and so I'd be interested, and I know that on the outskirts of what is now called the underground of hip-hop, there are plenty of resistors. Unfortunately, those are not the ones that show up on radios and show up in Power 100 stations uh, because those are not necessarily selling albums. We also know that as hip-hoppers, uh, you know, we, when I mean we, black and Latinx communities are not the biggest consumers of that. In fact, I grew up in a time when there were double deck cassette players, if y'all remember that. And somebody would get an album, you know, and you get it and you do a little high speed dubbing on there, all right? And you'd be making mixed tracks with that. So, of course, you know, one person goes out, you invest in one CD, and <laughs> you burn the rest, right? Um, that is not happening in some areas. And now, of course, with Spotify in particular going public, uh, we have redefined what the music industry is. It's no longer about record sales, it's about streams, it's about downloads. Uh, and when you can have 1.5 million streams within an hour, that's progress. Much bigger than what people can do and sell albums even within a week. So we're in a different era. We're in a different era. We're in a high consumeristic society. We consume everything. Nothing is trash anymore. Nothing is trash. Everything is reconsumable. And when on one end you think, well, that's great. But again, what are we consuming? So art is resistance. I mean, this is something that I think uh, it's been around for a long time, right, when you think about it. Um, when you think about just who has put material out there from Andre Serrano's Piss Christ in the, in the mid-'80s uh, to uh, versions of people, you know, who are consuming the butt on Fox television, the ass into the toilet, uh, to the multicolored American flag of showing and resisting and saying, hey, wait, there is a different type of representation out here. You can't just assume that all Americans think and act one way. And then, of course, you have the artist Chen Wingling, the Chinese artist, on the god of materialism and consumerism and how we ingest and take in all the things that we take in. This is really apparent, particularly during the holiday season, right? How much we can buy, how much we can get, how much more we can get. And so he reveals his art through this and showing us, you know, just how bad consumerism 
really is. Then, of course, we have all the aspects of, of art as resistance, right? A brother who lost his job because of resistance and, and because of standing up for what he felt was the right thing to do, right? This entertainment, we think about entertainment, we think about sports, what does that mean? What, is the, what does it mean to be your ethnicity in an all-white environment? So most of the times when we think about hip-hop, when you think about art and where these things come around, well, this is typically what comes to mind, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened to Flavor Flav, man. I don't know. I mean, this is the 80s, and this brother just went out. And here's the thing. I get it. When I was doing some interviews for this, uh, one of the books that I was working on, The Hip Hop Hostile Gospel, you know, I had a chance to interview uh, Jadakiss, you know, and he said it's much more complicated than you think. It's not as easy as just saying, hey, man, I need to talk about clean lyrics. He's like, look, man, my son, my daughter are all now old money. I bought my mama and my grandmother's brand new houses paid for. So what you think I'm supposed to be rapping about? You want me to be poor and talking about social justice crap? It's like, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I ain't, I ain't got a check to write you. Money is the religion of which we return to over and over and again. It is to which we pay the most homage to. It is the Nebuchadnezzarian statue that we kneel down to almost daily. Right? I mean, you have to. I mean, I'm not working at North Park for free. <laughs> I can't just show up to places, right? When I went and did my PhD, it was $5,000 a class, all right? So I couldn't just be up and be like, $5,000? Dang, oh, man, you know, shoot. I, I give y'all a hundred, you know, you know, I cook y'all some barbecue, and we work it out like that. Like, hell no, nah, I ain't going to work out like that. So money's big. We can't overlook it. Those of you in school already know that. Where am I going to work? How do I negotiate a salary? How do I work through those? What's in the be what are the benefit packages? And so I don't want to map this thing out to be it's so simple. Oh, we can just get rappers talking about positive things. Life is never that simple. It was never that simple during what we refer to between 1987 and 1997 as the golden era of hip hop. There was a mess going on then. But I think the difference is oftentimes that these become now mantra staples for how we, and particularly we as ethnic minorities, should act. I show up on all white comp campuses. Sorry about that. I show up on all white campuses and they say, look, this is how black people should be. This is how black people should react. This is how black people should talk. So when I'm talking about hip hop, I would like to, for this evening, Suspend this, hold it in tension a little bit. We can't overlook it. We can't talk about what I like to define as hip hop's really Achilles heel, which is its, its, its habitual misogyny and hatred of women on many levels. We cannot overlook that. That is something that continues to be a problem. Uh, unfortunately and fortunately, hip hop didn't invent that. Misogyny and hatred of women has been in this country and it's dipped and died as much as American pie is as American. So we have to begin to look at how those things also shape and how hip hop has picked up on that. So what I'm talking about tonight, I'd like to talk a little bit about some artists like Brother Tupac, like Diggable Planets. If you don't know who they are, I highly recommend you looking them up tonight. Prosco Brother Kendrick, you gotta talk about Kendrick. There's a lot going on with Brother Kendrick Lamar. Do y'all know that Kendrick actually, uh, I was, was privy to a, a situation in Los Angeles where he was actually, they laid hands on this brother, Snoop, Dre, Watts Prophets, these West, large, uh, West Coast uh, artists that a lot of folks don't even necessarily know about. I haven't grown up on the West Coast. There's a lot of underground uh, West Coast artists that came to him and said, man, you are taking the Tupac Alien mantle and moving forward with it. And he said, I am carrying this with me right now. He, says, I wanna, but I, he said, but I want to live differently than Tupac did. I don't want to die that young. It's very interesting what's going on with Kendrick. Of course, you got Lauren. Can't overlook her. Can't overlook Chance and what he's doing. Right? In fact, this brother's doing all kind of crazy good stuff, man, in Chicago. Stuff that probably doesn't even make it in the news. The fact that he gave $5 million to the school system a couple months ago. You know, and he's, he's going in on them right now. He's going in on all these little, uh, these little you know, they have these board meetings. They're like, oh, we can't keep the school open because of money. He's like, well, great, I got money. What else you need? What, 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 what excuses you got now? We gotta talk about Eve. Eve's great, J. Cole. Even Brother Lecrae. Lecrae's having a little bit of a woke moment, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> He's over there trying to do his thing. You know, he's just pissing off some white evangelicals. That's, I'm okay with that, you know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, you know, I haven't been big on what they define as holy and Christian hip-hop. I mean, it's, it's, it's there. I mean, it's, it's something we got to talk about. But Lecrae has stepped out and said, wait a minute. 
How can it be that these same folks who come and adorn and jump up and down in my music are still the ones saying that a body like mine is a terrorist? And so he's asking these questions, right? And of course, he's getting plenty of pushback. He's, he's caught, but his last three albums have been good. I'm even talking about crazy Kanye, all right? Don't get it twisted, 2003 to 2005, all right? Let's uh, make sure that's uh, clear with where we're at with Brother Kanye. No worries up over in that Trump Tower and all that. I was like, oh. But the roots of hip hop start with an aspect of consciousness. In my hip hop and religion course uh, in the falls that I teach, I actually take the constructs of hip hop culture all the way back to seventh and sixth century Africa. Um, and we look at how hip hop created itself a self a consciousness uh, even way back then. Now it emerged with what most scholars would say around 1971, 1972 was what has become known as now hip hop and rap culture. But consciousness was a big part, using your third eye, using the knowledge, using your brain, using your brain to better yourself, but not just yourself, because individualism tends to be from the West. It's also about collectivity. How can we better the community around us? How can we not turn into what they refer to as the, the crab barrel, right? You know, pulling everybody else down. Let's bring everybody else up. What a concept, right? Ties into self-awareness. How do you know about yourself? What is your emotional intelligence? Particularly as men, how do we deal with emotion? Now, I get that we can get angry. Can, that's one emotion that men are allowed to have, is anger. But when do you feel sad? When do you feel depressed? When do you feel joy? The litany of, 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 of emotions. And I would say, particularly at the underground level, there's a lot of this going on, a new definition of what masculinity looks like. But again, it's difficult to get that into the public sphere because that's not what black men are supposed to be like, right? That's not what Latinx men are supposed to be like, right? And so what does that mean? What does that look like when we're engaged? Community, we know that. Community coming together, being together, uh, being one another, being, being connected. That's a big part of, of hip hop culture. Of course, aspects of spirituality, which we'll get into um, this evening. And then unity and love of God and self. The reality of it is, is that just because we disagree doesn't necessarily mean we're out of unity. Unity does not connote that we always agree and just, and just simply get along. But there is a sense that we're not tearing each other down. One of the things that a lot of people don't know is that, yes, there was a beef back in the day with NWA and the whole madness between Ice Cube and, and Easy e But prior to Easy es death, uh, and I wish they would show this a little bit more in the film, uh, there was actually a whole reconciliation time. Because if this was by, by around the end of 93, beginning of 94, uh, you know, folks were like, it's pretty evident that this is what, uh, um, you know, EZ has. He has AIDS, he's going to die. And so there was a whole reckoning between the whole group. Um, and they came together, held hands, prayed the whole nine. But most people don't see that, right? We see, oh, they was beefing. And now beefs are just dumb. I mean, come on, man. I mean, really? You're going to have the two women in hip hop really go at each other like that? Like, really? But I get it. Stuff sells. An album sell, right? You get one diss album, you got to have another diss album because now you know that people are just waiting. Like, what are you going to say? What are you going to do? I would posit to you that this is not necessarily in the roots of the culture. How do we unify? How do we build each other up? Speaking of the culture, well, let me throw out a definition. So these are some of the roots that I've found and just some of the research and the work that I've done. But let me throw out a definition. It's a working definition, but nonetheless, I like to have definitions because I am an academic after all, all right? So we got to define what we're talking about. So hip hop is an urban subculture that seeks to express a lifestyle, attitude, and or urban individuality. Hip hop at its core, not the commercialization and commodity it has become in certain respects, rejects dominant forms of culture and society and seeks to increase a social consciousness along with a racial and ethnic pride. Thus, hip hop uses rap music, dance, music production, MCing, and allegory as vehicles to send and fund its message of social, cultural, and political resistance to dominant structures of norms. I say it's a working definition because I went, went back and changed this a whole bunch of times. I mean, I think even now the word urban is an homogenous term. What does it mean, urban? In Chicago, urban is not urban anymore. In fact, suburban poverty now outnumbers urban poverty five to one. It was three to one a couple of years ago. It's increasing. Because then downtown Chicago, the inner city, is no longer the inner city. It's a nice upper middle class to upper class wealthy community. 11.5, 11.8, 15.9 million dollar condos all being paid for in cash. 
So when you tell me there's no money, no, there's money. And it's just not necessarily coming where we want it to come. So this ideology around urban is changing. In many regards, we're heading to where uh, cities and in metropolitan complexes like Paris are already. The inner city is very wealthy, and the outer city is just that. They're out. The hood is on the outskirts of the city. Well, we're headed that way. Chicago's just a case study. So this is that word needs to say. And one of the students, I, I gave them this uh, definition uh, uh, in the fall, and they were like, you know what, Dan, I, I like that, but man, hip-hop now is a dominant structure of norm. Does it resist itself? Man, that's a good question. So I think there's some things that we have to hold in tension here because back in the day, see, you had to really search for Ice-T's album. Before Ice-T was Ice-T, right? You know what I'm saying? I remember Ice-T, and he used to live up on, uh, on, on 57th and South Central, right? People already knew where all these artists were. It wasn't the conglomerate that we have now, right? You knew where these cats were. So when they released an album, you had to work to find the album, even, even just finding the album, right? There, was, there were none of these back when I was a kid. There was like, you had to actually go to the store, warehouse records, you know what I'm saying, back when Borders was still around. Um, but, you know, slowly over time, things started to change, right? 1989, the first Grammy Award goes to the first hip-hop song. Remember that song? You know it. You love them. Parents just don't understand Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Of course, DJ Jazzy Jeff, who was actually a genius. Man, that guy, the part he played on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was just undermining his actual smartness and intelligence. If you don't follow him, follow him on Instagram, a couple places. Man, he's, he's amazing. But that's, that, that Grammy, uh, that, that, that particular Grammy Award set off a whole new era of understanding. And so now, hip-hop's everywhere, right? You can get it. It's used to sell everything. Chairs, pants, hot dogs. I mean, it's everywhere. But it's also deracialized. Oftentimes, when you hear a hip-hop track, you'll see a white face, but not the people who are producing it. So we have a very strong loss of history in our society now. I have young people that I work with under the age of 15 who still believe that the Chronic album was the beginning of hip-hop culture. Yeah, I know, bless them, bless them, bless them. And will fight me tooth and nail to argue otherwise. So things are going on. Well, what else about it? That's hip-hop, what about rap? Rap is the main medium of the hip-hop culture that brings what? Definition, value, understanding, and appreciation to what? The social isolation, economic hardship, political demoralization, and cultural exploitation endured by, endured by most ghetto and poor white communities. That definition is important. So oftentimes, you begin to think, man, I'm, I'm just living in crazy. And it's one thing coming from the West Coast, because the projects on the West Coast, they can have ocean views. In South Central, from the projects, you can see the Hollywood signs. So it's like almost you can see what living should be like, and it, but it's completely out of reach, right? When you think about San Mateo and the Bay Area and many places, you can drive through the hood in Oakland and see these houses up in the hills and think, man, why aren't I there? Why aren't there communities like this? Unlike places in Chicago where you do, you have, you know, open lots, broken glass everywhere. People pissing on the floor like they just don't care, right? You know, it's like it's a whole different environment when you see the hood in other places. But on the West Coast, it's almost mysterious, like you shouldn't see it. So when rappers came out and said, man, F the police, this was something that we were already enduring as young people, being exploited and beat down by the police. And when I was young, you talk about guns in school, I had to have a gun. I had four, as a matter of fact. I considered myself the black Ferris Bueller when I was in high school. I didn't sell no drugs as a hustle. I couldn't. I sold drugs for like a week until my auntie came to me and was like, Dan, I'll buy something for you for sexual favors. And I was like, that's it. I'm done. I'm out the game. <laughs> But I also wasn't about to work at McDonald's for $4.25 an hour. Stop it. You know what I'm saying? I your brother got to look good. So I said, well, so my hustle was, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, computers were easy to get into. And so I would uh, hack the school's computer and I would sell grades. You, know, you failed your class, a D's 200, you know, a C's 400. You know, if you want an A, it's 100, $1,000 and stuff. And so that was part of my game, right? You think I'm lying. You know, I'm not. I'm not. I made that. That's how, I, that's how I made it. And so consequently, I was into the locker system. And so I had myself four different lockers. In California, there are no hallways. Like, this is beautiful. A library that has hallways. In California, it's just nice. So everything's outside. So we had all our lockers outside. But in my freshman year of my high school, it's back in the, uh, in the mid-'80s, we had four different shootouts. And if you didn't have a gun, you need to be around somebody who did have a gun. Because it was about safety. It was about protection. Because you would have rival people come up. These weren't always gangs, by the way, either. People always just kind of want to put us all in one group. There's differences in levels in different aspects. There are cliques. There are sets. 
There's straight up organized gangs. There's loose leaf gangs. People just say, hey, you want to hang out? You want to hang out? Yeah, we got, well, who we mess with my crew? All right. And cats would just show up and start shooting. None of this stuff ever made it to the news. None of this stuff ever made it in the paper. You know, just a bunch of niggas dead, a bunch of niggas shooting each other. So to have rappers talk about this and validate what is happening in my community was huge. Was huge. People didn't believe us when we first telling them that the police were beating us up. Oh, that can't be happening. The police are your friend. You know, like Richard Pryor used to say, that's because the police live in your neighborhood. You know them as Officer Timpson and Officer Johnson. We know them as, get out the car and put your hands up in the air, right? So to give value to that was huge. Thus, rap music is the musical expression that complements the oral communication of its culture. Rap also captures and esteems the ghetto poor existence as valid and real to all people of color, including many poor and disenfranchised whites. You know that white people, poor white people, broke white people, outnumber black and Latinx people combined in this country? Oh, yeah, but poverty tends to have a color in this country. Welfare, black mamas, right? That's, we'll, we'll see that. But we won't see the poor disenfranchised that were galvanized to vote for a man who could care less about them and their issues, but they were told if these people cross the border, they'll take your job. Fool, they already got your job. I don't see you out there in the field. I grew up in the Central Valley of California. I didn't see no people, no alt-riders out there trying to pick no cabbage, no strawberries. But that's where we live, right? That rhetoric and discourse make you believe that your ally is really your enemy. Rap also captures the seems to get up for existence is real to all people of color, including many poor whites. But here's the problem. Rap brings the revenue and fuels the culture in this message. Money ruins everything. I always tell folks, man, look, you go to get into, you get into a relationship, man, you, you got to talk about money. And if you go to involve money, it's like sex. Sex, man, it's just, sex changes everything. You can't see somebody naked and then see them the next day and be like, hey, what's up, man, you know? <laughs> money, man, the three times that I've gotten involved in relationships of friends of mine with money, all three of those relationships are still damaged to this day. Money changes things. So money is a big deterrent, and it's also a galvanizer as well. But a lot of the young brothers and sisters who are getting picked up on the street to go and put albums out don't understand the first thing about economics. When you think about somebody who offers you a $12 million record deal, you're not seeing most of that money. First and foremost, when you sign as an artist, most of the times you're going to have to work with the record company's actual producers and the people that they already have signed on them. And then if you want a rapper like, oh, I don't know, 2 chains to come on, 2 chains charge $72,000 a minute to be on your rap album. Where does that come out of? 12, your $12 million. You're going to have to go to our studios. That charges you about three or $4,000 an hour to record. We want you to master at this mastering house. That all the money comes out. I've had friends of mine you know, who knew economics and were like, this is a bad deal. I'm going to end up indebted to the record company. And now, of course, I'm going to have to say what they want me to say, sing how they want me to sing, deal with what they want me to deal with. Because the record industry, particularly after Biggie's uh, death in 1997, started buying up all of the independent record companies. The big, the big, the big four, right? BMI, ASCAP, Sony, Warner Music Groups, they were all major labels that picked up all of these independent labels. Independent labels, you can say whatever you want, right? All of those things got burnt down, and you know, it's just it's very interesting to see just, again, how money, somebody offers you enough money, be like, yeah, here you go. Here, take it, you know? Beats headphones. I mean, Dre had that idea back in the 80s. I remember him talking about, because again, you knew these cats just as anybody as you know, you can be like, man, I want these, these noise-canceling headphones. People like, man, shut up, man. You ain't, you ain't getting no damn you know, noise-canceling headphones. And now, you know, he sold that stuff off to Apple, and now, you know, I mean, well, Dre was already had a lot of money. But nonetheless, it's not easy to be in those places. People say, well, look at Jay-Z, right? Well, look at him. Tell me how many other rappers live like him. Tell me how many more. Because it's so, it's so crowded at the bottom, very crowded. So what happens then when we think about resistance? How does this come together? Well, the great Charles Long says it like this. He says, religion is thus understood to be pervasive, not only in religious institutions, but in all dimensions of cultural life. We can't overlook hip hop and say that religion and spirituality is not there, especially as it speaks to oppression, especially as it speaks to uh, forms of oppression and, and resistance. But things come along in life. I always say live long enough and you'll have a Job moment. When you say, what happens then when the encounter with the numinous, and that's just a fancy, well, we're at Princeton. Y'all know what the numinous is. I, I got a place there. What is numinous? Well, yeah, Princeton. Y'all know what that means. What happens when the numinous 
The religious experience can no longer find adequate expression in the traditional religious institutions provided by the culture. This is what Black Lives Matter people are asking. What happens when we've been organizing for years? We've been, we've been coming together for years. We've been signing petitions for years. And why does Black Lives Matter even have to exist under the eight years of a black presidency? What happens when the mantras of theological expression and, and you know, fasting and prayer don't tend to quote unquote work? And now you have a generation on the outskirts saying, I don't know about this. Traditionalized religion, traditionalized church are viewed as, tend to be just as dogmatic sketches of a life that was and that no longer needs to exist. So when you think about a hip hop theology, like, oh man, what the hell are you talking about, dude? But I love this album cover of Section 80. I love this, it's one of my favorite album covers. It involves everything that John Michael Spencer defines as the sacred, the secular, and the profane. This, for me, is where I find God at those, all three of those intersections. And this, this album cover embodies all of that. You got the Holy Bible. You got some weed. You got some bullets. You know what I'm saying? If you look in the corner close, you got some sexual items there, which the church tends to have major problems with, right? Sexuality, especially women in their uh, embodiment of sexuality. That's a whole problem. So Kendrick is saying, now let's deal with it. Let's put it all on the table. Let's have these conversations. Let's engage with this. Let's embrace some of these things. And so this album cover in particular um, is representation of, again, the sacred, secular, and profane. Well, let's take a step back just for a second or two and ask, how did we end up here? How did we get to this spot? So I want to talk about some major societal shifts, and then I'll get into some more representations of, of, of artist resistance. I want to start with World War II now, and, and several of the other works I've done, I've taken, taken it further back, but for the sake of time, I wanted to start with World War II, because World War II uh, is a pivotal joint in time. It's almost like a lot of, of time and space intersects at this moment, because we're moving from binary ideology, good and bad, right, evil and good, right, Nazi Germany is bad, we're the best. Every year here in the United States, we have a new World War II film come out. Just wait, be another one. Round the block. If you miss this one, you gotta get another one. We love that era collectively in the American imagination. Why? Because it lifts the Eurocentric mind on elevation. We're the best. We live a certain way, we value certain things, we want to go back. This is when America, quote unquote, was great. <laughs> Never mind the fact that black soldiers that went and fought in the war, you know, died for this country, came back to an, it was a segregated country. I mean, and, you know, this goes on to the Vietnam War, which I'll talk about here in a second. But the World War II gave the country a great time of, of economic upheaval. It was, as the Japanese said at that time, the awakening of a sleeping giant. And that sleeping giant was revealed, of course, in, you know, in economics. And World War II was, it was an amazing time because it was the first time that, uh, well, one of the first times, World War I, if you think about it just from a sheer military perspective, you know, back in the day, warfare was, we're going to go out in the field, you're going to line up your peoples, I'm going to line up my peoples, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to shoot, then you're going to shoot. I, and that's the thing, man, you know what I'm saying? I, maybe I'm just because from the hood, and I'm like, man, you ain't just going to get a free shot. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You ain't just going to stand there and just, you know, you're just going to give it. But, you know, think about it. You got one shot, and you got to load it back up and put the powder in. Like, oh, man, that ended in World War II. Now you have the use of guerrilla warfare. Now you have the use of militarization, the military industrial complex. You know, part of my family, I embody the Afro-Latino experience, and so the Mexican side of my family came over in the Bracero program in the 1920s, helped build the ships and the bombers and the, uh, and the boats and all those things in the 1930s and 1940s to fund the war. War is money. We know that. We even talked a little bit about it in episode eight in Star Wars, right? You know, it's big money. People who fund both the good and the bad side. World War II began to shift that, but by the time you get to the 1960s, you have what most scholars and most literal scholars talk about, the postmodern or the post-soul transference. You have now a generation born in the ruins of the, uh, of the war who's saying, wait a minute, what's going on in our country right now? Why were we in Vietnam for four years and no one even spoke of? Why are we even there? Now you have a generation that say, wait a minute, no Vietnamese ever called me a nigga. Why are we fighting this? We have to fight this at home. You have the rise of what we now call the modern day civil rights movement, which unfortunately has been boiled down to a paragraph in most history books. That's also not done on by accident. But 1960 
created the sense of what we now know as transmediation. This is the first time we see a war, the Vietnam War, for what it really is. It was the first televised war. Now, World War II was pretty. It was like, oh, our soldiers are kicking ass, right? Oh, they're doing all these great things. Vietnam showed the realness of what war is. You have people with third degree burns now on television, getting their brains blown out. You have soldiers that are crossing the line of ethics and, you know, uh, and when I was doing some interviews with World War II or Vietnam veterans, you know, they were talking about one brother said, look, I was trained to kill. I was dealing with issues of bipolarism. He said, so when I came back to society, I didn't know how to handle it. I knew I was going to kill somebody. So rather than getting arrested for it, I re-enlisted in the army and went back and killed because I would get paid to do it. You see what I'm saying? And that was just over and repeated over and over. The killing mentality and strategies actually changed from World War II to Vietnam. See, the kill rate wasn't very big in World War II. Most of the kills were done by bombs and air raids and whatnot because there's something innately wrong when somebody's shooting at you and you run towards it. So by the time Vietnam came, they learned the psychological inference of dehumanizing. No, no human being can kill another human being. You have to dehumanize them. I have to call you a gook or a chink or a, some other lowland high, you know, a person, a human being, and then I can kill you. In Vietnam, the kill rates went up big time. But of course, we didn't know what to do with that. So of course, the veterans came back. We're still dealing with it, right? You go to almost any street corner, especially in Chicago. I mean, we have a lot of Vietnam veterans on the corners who still don't know what to do with those thoughts, right? By the time you get to the 1970s, we have the rise of the post-industrial complex and the post-soul culture. We have the rise of black popular culture with that. We have the rise also of what's called relevant television, relevant television programming. We think about something like All in the Family and what that represented. Archie Bunker, the old school bigot, fighting against his son-in-law, who's the liberal, the, the, the raging liberal, right? We also have, though, at this time, one of the lowest rates of household debt. That changed by the time we got to the 80s, because consumerism went up with the Reagan era. Reagan era created what we now call as the popular culture era. 1981, MTV goes online, when it was actually still music television, right? They'd show videos 24 hours a day, like, dang, their first song was Video Killed the Radio Star. I don't know if y'all remember that. I remember that song. Now what? what MTV shows like, what, one video every five months or something like that? It's crazy, right? But this development of culture and, and consumerism, household debt income increased 512% between 1978 and 1985, not even a 10-year span. The creation of the personal credit card, the creation of having it all, the creation of being able to see yourself on TV was a high influx of commercialism and commercialization during this era. So by the time that the 1990s come, critical inquiry and the information age started to take over. And you have the rise of what a lot of scholars now refer to as the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, those who have no religious affiliation. Because this was the first time people started saying, wait a minute, this information is now locked up in some, I can go read the Bible, I can translate these things for myself? I don't have to go to the professional? Oh, okay, great. But by the time you reach the 2000s, the major shift that has affected most of the young people today is 9-11. That was probably one of the greatest shifts that we've had probably since World War II and beyond. Because it created this sense of the culture of fear, and it also created the sense that we have to be protected at any rate. One of the first times that publicly white people said, hey, blacks, come with us and let's be one as Americans, right? Can you believe that they hate us for just who we are? And of course, black people were like, yeah, we can believe that. We can believe that, um, okay. But 9-11, post 9-11 culture created something else. It also created new laws and policies. So that was uh, stuff that was on people's wish list prior to that. You know, all five Patriot Acts that passed were people's wish list in 1999. They couldn't get that passed. No knock seizures, what? You know what I'm saying? You can collectively put this group right now in this room and say you are a threat to national security. They can detain us without hold, without remorse, for as long as they want, move us and ship us off the country on the land and not have to think twice about it. That's law right now. That is law. It's one of the reasons why police units are moving quickly to make an organization like Black Lives Matter a terrorist organization. Because once that happens, the game changes. Because once you're associated with a known terrorist, bank accounts get frozen. Think about how much stuff is locked up in electronic stuff now. And we don't even balance our checkbook anymore on, our, you know, on the paper way. Think about what happens when everything gets frozen up. 
So 9-11 changed a lot, and then to where we currently are with white nationalism, white fear, and the white Christian state. So these are some major eras that I would hope hip hoppers would begin to take up and say, we, we have a lot to talk about. It's a lot to engage with. Here's what Brother Tupac uh, had to say. Well, even before we get to Brother Tupac, I wanted to also talk a little bit about some of the things that, um, yes, we talked about the nuns, privatization of military, complex culture fear. All right, we covered that already. But uh, let, me get to, well, let me get to Pac, and then I'll, I'll come back to some of these things as well, because I also want to talk about some of the things that black millennials have had to deal with, like, you know, Gina Six, uh, Katrina, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in aspects of that. So let me play this little short clip for you. This is, this is Tupac talking a little bit about, back then, about what this generation is dealing with. You know, we are a part of the black community. I'm a thug, and I rap about the oppressed fighting back. Yes, my raps are filled with rage. One of these days, we gotta bust back for the home, man. You have to be logical, you know? If, if I know that in this hotel room, they have food every day, and I'm knocked on the door every day to eat, and they tell, and they open the door, let me see the, the party, let me see, like, them throwing salami all over the, I mean, just, like, throwing food around, where they're telling me there's no food in here. You know what I'm saying? Every day. I'm standing outside trying to sing my way in. You know what I'm saying? We are hungry, please let us in. We are hungry, please let us in. After about a week, that song is going to change to We hungry, we need some food. After two, three weeks, it's like, you know, give me all the food, we're breaking out the door. And after a year, and you're just like, you know what I'm saying? I'm picking the lock, coming through the door, blasting. You know what I'm saying? It's like you hungry, you reached your level, you don't want any more. We asked 10 years ago. We was asking with the Panthers. We was asking with them, you know, the civil rights movement. We was asking, you know. Now, now those people that were asking, they're all dead and in jail. So now, what do you think we're going to do? Ask? I put my gun away and grab my AK. It's getting hectic. I can't call it. House full of alcoholics. Now our niggas under pressure. So we have a generation that is raising this post-civil rights era that says, I'm not going to ask anymore. It's a generation raising the ruins of the Reagan crack cocaine era, okay? It's a generation raising the womb of media culture, especially those, I mean, the entering freshman class of this, uh, of this year will have been born in the year 2000. They were born at a time when social media was just getting started, right? And I think about my daughter that was born in 2006. She's known nothing but social media. In fact, the other day we were in a, uh, a car and she looked outside and she said, Dad, why is there a phone outside? She's pointing to a, pointing to a phone booth, right? I was like, yeah, you're right. That is kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> oh, why would there be a phone outside? But think about it. Think about what they have experienced just in that short period from 2006 to now. It's a generation raised in the ambiguity of morals, ethics, and social values, especially with the president that we have in office right now. I have young people who say, wait, you tell me not to lie. You tell me not to bully because that's not going to get me anywhere, yet that's exactly who I see who's in charge right now. So this ambiguity then, right, begins to set in. You begin to ask yourself, well, huh, what are these values? And really, how do we deal with aspects of violence? Because black people have always been told not to use violence as a means of to succeed in their ways. Yet this country is highly violent. I mean, people celebrated when Osama bin Laden was killed, right? Dancing in the streets. Yeah? There's not much difference between the military industrial complex and the gangs that are located in some of the neighborhoods that I work in. One's accepted, one's not. You do something to us, we're going to do something to you. America ain't going to sit down and just be like, OK, yeah, you're right. No, we have to show a, a might, a strong force of might, right? That's hypermasculinity, all that mess. You know, we're talking about passing gun laws. It's going to be, it's going to be more than gun laws that's going to have to change. This is ideology. Laws never institute or correct ideology or morals and ethics. If that had been the case in 1964 when we passed the Civil Rights Act, we as black folks, we'd be all celebrating everything right now. We would never be having these conversations. I'd be out of a job, right? <laughs> but a generation raised on those ambiguities. It's also a generation raised on one of the greatest shifts in Christian faith, probably since the, the, the Reformation. Young people now say, you know, I can tell young people, I mean, can you look up the Greek word for this? Yep, right here. You go down. Yep. Oh, yeah. I need to take Greek. I need to take, need to take all those classes. I've got it right here. I'm already checking it 300 times a day. And that's just one device. I didn't mention that, right? That's just one device. Multiple devices, over 1,100 times a day. And you got to take it in the screen of the laptop, tablet, that. Um, and, it's, and, it, and it increases as the, uh, as the generations um, are getting younger as well. So it's something that you have to engage with, right? Generation raising, post-9-11 America, we talked about that. Generation raises technology as normality and identity. 
right? I got students right now. I mean, one of the things that technology does is it makes you impatient, right? Because, you know, think about it. Think of, let that Wi-Fi get slow, right? Oh, man, you angry as a mofo. Man, like, God dang it. Man, this is tripping, man. We, we impatient. Oh, we impatient. My phone, you know, it's a little older. I'm, I'm, I'm a little cheap. I, I paid off my iPhone, so I don't want to get a new iPhone. Plus, it still has the headphone jack. I like the headphone jack. I don't know what the hell Apple was talking about. Think about it, you know? Plus, I'm not a big Apple person and stuff. Although, as a musician, I love Logic Pro. So I do have my uh, Logic Pro X on, on, on a machine. Um, but nonetheless, my daughter hates getting on my phone because she's like, that is so slow. It's glitchy. Like, Where'd you learn glitchy? What, what is Normality and identity. My daughter is given a, an iPad, and they no longer submit hard copies of homework. It's all submitted online. She's learning her languages online, an app. She's learning to speak Spanish and French online. <laughs> online! You're like, oh my gosh, what is the era we're living in? We're also raised in a gener or generation raised on the McDonaldization thesis, which is efficiency, calculability, control, and effectiveness as soci uh, social normality and ways of doing life. Right? This is, uh, you know, you have the, you know, the notion of multitasking. You have the notion of people, you know, doing more. You know, we have a very, very busy generation, especially those under the age of 15. They're going to band rehearsal. They're going to dance. They're going to, you know, now you got, you know, the new activist generation. They're going to, to uh, nonviolent peace protest, you know, training. I'm like, dang, you can fit that in between flute and clarinet rehearsal? Good night. I was just happy to be playing with G.I. Joes in the, in the backyard, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got kicked out of band. Um, mainly because uh, at the time I was in, well, I was living in Texas, and I used to, I used to want to play the tritons, you know, the oh man. But uh, the band director, I don't know if I told you all this, because uh, I grew up, I don't claim it. I, I claim California as home, but I was born in Texas, a small rural community, uh, and the band director at that time was very racist, H. K. Petty, and he would openly say, you know, no nigger will ever march on my field in first chair, because you know to march you have to be first chair. I was beating people out left and right. No niggas ever gonna raise. I loved it because all five of his daughters dated black men and got married to black men and got them black babies there, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Places were crazy, man. Texas is crazy. Not the big towns, but the small rural communities, man. Woo! So we have a generation raised on this, right? How you can efficiency, how you can calculate, how you can control your time and manage your time better. Generation, ra generation raised on likes and follows. My daughter loves likes and follows. How many people watch her video, right? How many people how many like it? You haven't seen the, gener uh, the documentary called Generation Like? You go take a look at it. It's on PBS Frontline. It's a great documentary. You know, we also have our, our generation raised to organize and critically think. When you think about BLM, it wasn't for that McDonald's right there on Ferguson Avenue that had free Wi-Fi. We might not know about what happened. Black Lives Matter starts because of a hashtag, right? It starts because somebody said, man, remember, your life matters. And then people picked up on that. And the next thing you know, it's, you know, it's a whole movement. We have that now. We can't overlook that. A generation seeking Jesus unfiltered and raw, not religion. When you think about Jesus, let me, let me go there a minute. Let me talk about some of these more, this contextualization, right, of what this resistance looks like in Jesus. Because Jesus was a revolutionary dude. We've domesticated Jesus so much, turned Jesus into a punk. I don't, you know, I, I don't want to get to heaven and find out I can kick God's ass. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, nah, man, I don't want that. Who wants a God you can kick their butt? No one wants that. Although those are some of the images that we've been given, right? This is what Ebony Utley says. Jesus fraternized with sexually licentious women, cavorted with their sinners, worked on the Sabbath, had a temper, used profane language with religious people, praised faithfulness over stilted forms of religious piety, and honored God more than the government. Gangsters respect Jesus because they see the parallels between his life and theirs. When I began to discover who Jesus was historically, as a man of color, let me just clear that up, I found out that it was actually my seminary at North Park that created the white Jesus, the white, the blonde hair and the blue eyes. I was like, you got to be effing kidding me, right? Uh, you, you kidding me? Like, we did that? That's our contribution to fame. So I've been trying to get more black Jesus, you know, hashtag black Jesus out there. I don't know, it's not picking up too much, though. Um, Jesus' story is hip-hop. You think about it. Come on now. Jesus had baby mama drama, right? You know what I'm saying? Marrying the issue of virginity. Come on now. City officials hated him. Oh, my gosh. Religious seen him as a threat, Sadducees and Pharisee. Beat down by the law. Oh, my gosh. One of his boys did him in. What? That is hip-hop, man. Hung out on the margins. But one of the key aspects that we tend to miss, and this is what Obery Hendricks talks about in his book, The Politics of Jesus, is that he resisted systemic forms of oppression 
and sought to replace them and challenge them. And we miss that, because oftentimes I hear this all the time with some of my evangelical brethren and sisters, you know. We need more Jesus and less talk about justice. What? Right, exactly. How in the hell is that possible? But that's where we're at, right? That's kind of where we're at. And so when you think about this connection, this is part of where hip hoppers are able to connect to. When you think about artists that are talking about, man, I'm connected to the reverend, the pimp, and the pusher. We're all lost souls trying to find our way to heaven. When you begin to see and begin to connect with what Kendrick is after, and when he's trying to wrestle with and say, man, I'm dealing with depression. I'm dealing with aspects of suicidal thoughts, which is very high in our black community. Four out of every, one out of every four black people think about suicide. And unfortunately, I've had the uh, unfortunate uh, 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 um, duty to do is to preside over suicidal black friends of mine that went through with it, went through with the, with the, uh, with the deed. And so these are the things that he's trying to say we need to deal with, we need to engage with. The Roots album, the Undone album, that was a concept album. Now, I love iTunes, but one of the things iTunes does is it takes away the aspect of the art in the album. Concept albums are a story told from track one to the final track. And they're talking about depression. Face down in the water, they're talking about being addicted to alcohol. They're talking about these addictions, and they're opening up saying, they're saying, look, here are my issues. And so part of the aspects of a post-civil rights faith development in the era of protest is moving ourselves out of unconsciousness and consciousness in, into an aspect of consciousness. However you want to define church. I'm not talking about the traditional forms like we go to church and no, oh, hallelujah, everything. That's cool. But as I'm looking at it, church is being redefined. It's on street corners. All right? It's, on, it's in places and spaces that most people wouldn't think. When I was in uh, Paris, I don't speak no French. I couldn't even figure out where the, the exit was. It was sortie. I said, like, what the hell is sortie? Where's exit? Exit, you know what I'm saying? And they're like, no, this is the way, bro. This is the way. But how we connected was through hip-hop. I rolled out some Pac. I rolled out some Lauryn Hill, and we were able to have five and a half hours of communication through music, the resistance, right? But we got to be careful, y'all. Because after we have some kind of conversion event, after about two years, just psychologically and metaphysically, we become traditioned. If you're into healthcare, you already know that your muscles, when you work out, your muscles just get, they, they work to it, right? They know you have to do what's called muscle confusion if you really want to build muscle. Because your body works up to it and it says, I'm cool now, I got you, I can keep up. That's not how you grow. You grow through pain, you go through aspects of doubt. This doubt. This is important in the faith development. This is something that a lot of Christianity hasn't given. You think about the historical connections of Christianity. When I say the historical connections, I really mean that stuff in material and theology that is prior to the Middle Ages. Because once you have the Middle Ages, you really have a colonized Western theology. And really the stuff that a lot of African-American churches have gotten um, is a colonized theology of who God is. And prior to that, you can see how doubt and mystery and enlightenment of who God was was really embodied. This notion of a personal savior, that's not necessarily even biblical. That was Whitfield who started that in the late 18th century and came around and started saying we need a personal relationship. That's not in the original African canon of Christianity. It was about collective engagement with spirituality and to resist the trickster. The devil didn't even look like we looked at in the devil. The devil, that's more of a Dante's Inferno devil. The pointy tail and the horns and all that stuff like that. That's a European creation. Where then we can we begin to find where God shows up in the mystery, the doubt, in the enlightenment? So these are some areas that I think that are important, particularly as we start to uh, embody uh, art as resistance. I think that uh, it's important that we look at these things. I think it's important that we also, again, deal with the, the madness that is commercialized rap and hip-hop. But I also think it's important that we begin to, for really those of us who consider ourselves woke, however you want to define yourself as woke, you consider yourself woke. I think it's important you take that wokeness and then help somebody else as well. Walk with somebody. Talk with somebody. Engage with somebody. The PhD I have is not, I mean, don't get me wrong, I like dressing up, but this is not the way I dress up every day. I got to get back out there and engage my young brothers and sisters that are still in the struggle because they are easily three decades behind where the generation was in 1992 when I graduated high school was. And they, these, these students are off. It's, it's, it's a challenge right now especially in places like in Chicago in the Austin neighborhood and on the South Side. Students that are A students in most struggling high schools are more like D plus students when they get to college. 
And so we have some issues that we got to be engaging with. And that's why I'm, I'm encouraged when I see Chance getting out there trying to do some stuff. Let me leave you this video, and then while I want to open it up for some questions. This is, again, this is Brother Tupac. I'm sorry I did my dissertation on him, so I, I have some video on the brother. You know what I'm saying? I want to ask you about something that someone else asked you in the interview, and I thought the answer was interesting because I think it speaks to you and your generation a lot. Someone said, where do you see Tupac 10 years from now? He said, hey, I just want to be alive. That's real for you. That's so real. I can't. I, I made a metamorphosis. I'm a new person to that because I used to strongly and honestly, honestly, I feel like I could represent my generation so much because I honestly did not care whether I lived or died. But now I cannot die with people thinking I'm a rapist or a criminal. I can't leave until this is straight. You know, I'm not suicidal. I'm not, I can't go until y'all really know what time it is. And then after that, boom, it's all over. And we can see, you know, how this shit fall. But that's how it is. And the reason being is because if I can't live free, if I can't live with the same respect as the next man, I don't want to be here. Because God has cursed me to see what life should be like. If God wanted me to be this person and be happy here, he wouldn't let me feel so oppressed. He wouldn't let me feel so trampled on. You know what I'm saying? He wouldn't let me think the things I think. So I feel like I'm doing God's work. You know what I'm saying? Just because I don't have nothing to pass around for people to put money in the bucket don't mean I ain't doing God's work. I feel like I'm doing God's work. You know what I'm saying? Because these ghetto kids ain't God's children. And I don't see no missionaries coming through there. You know what I'm saying? So I'm doing God's work. While Rev Reverend Jackson do his shit up in the middle class and he go to the White House and have dinner and pray over the president, I'm up in the hood, you know what I'm saying, doing my work with my fucks. And just because I don't live there don't mean I don't go there. I got to go there because I can't hang nowhere else. It's my contact information. Let a brother know what's up. Profane Faith Podcast. We'll continue some of these conversations. There's some books. But most importantly, thank you so much for your time and attention. Appreciate it. Thank you.